Welcome to the Retail Focus Podcast, a weekly collection of news, interviews, and information from the world of retail. Here are your hosts, Trent Kling and Leighton Kling. Welcome to this edition of the Retail Focus Podcast with Trent and Leighton Kling. Coming up on today's show, you know, it was a negative week. I think in retail news, we're going to try and keep it a little bit more positive. We're going to talk about some specialty retail openings later on in the show, as well as a big bill getting passed by New York's city council and passed on to Mayor Bill de Blasio there in the northeastern United States. We'll lead our show by talking about some retail closings, and there were quite a few of those this week that were announced. Our interview guest for this week's episode of the podcast is Marianne Slamish. She is the head of marketing at Pointer, and she'll be joining us talking about actually location services being used in stores and kind of the future of location services. A quick reminder, you can check us out on Twitter and Instagram at Retail Podcast. Also, be sure, give us a like or rate us however you do access us, whether that's on Spotify or maybe Apple Podcasts. Podcast Addict, Podcast Republic, and so forth. Those ratings sure do help out. Well, as we mentioned, much of the retail news was a little bit negative this week. Closures were announced for several retail brands. Closures, in particular for Express, hit the news. We're not going to talk about them. And honestly, Leighton, I don't know about you, but I think of Express as kind of that undifferentiated retail that we've been seeing closed down. And they haven't really been differentiated since the 90s in any way, shape, or form. But we are going to talk about a retailer that was differentiated, that did announce some closures this week. Some different things going on. We can't really tell how well the stores themselves were doing, but it has to do with a much larger retailer pulling back some of their support. And we see this as maybe the potential first domino in the natural food space falling because big news came by way of Lucky's Market this week, and it's not news of the positive sort. First, we should note that we are talking about Lucky's Market, not the Lucky Supermarkets chain that is ubiquitous throughout my now home state. This segment has seen robust expansion in the last five years with both Sprouts Farmers Market and Natural Grocers expanding into different markets with pretty much different demographics here. And you see that Sprouts tends to expand market by market and they have managed to really ratchet up pressure heavily over the last few years on Whole Foods. Meanwhile, Natural Grocers has increased their focus on mid-sized markets, especially small towns in the Mountain West. And while all this is happening, Kroger, of course, Albertsons, Safeway, Publix, Walmart, and others are constantly increasing their natural and organic selection. Kroger, in particular, as we've talked about on nearly every one of their quarterly earnings calls, has made sizable waves with their newest line of different private label selections plant-based products like generic Beyond Burger and Dairy-Free Alfredo, along with just a slew of all-natural and organic options aside from those things. And you see that all of this has pretty much taken its toll on Lucky's, which didn't have the scale of those operators and struggled to expand to the same extent as their competitors. We talk about supply chain. We talk about massive distribution. Trent, Walmart, Kroger, Albertsons, they all have that where Lucky's does not, so it's really hard to compete in this space. And the news this week indicates that rather than expanding, Lucky's will be contracting nearly 75% of their store base in the very near future. In fact, notifications were actually posted on individual store Facebook pages on Tuesday, and discounting is already underway at the affected locations. It will not be a slow liquidation process, as it turns out, with most locations expected to close within the next three weeks. Indeed, 32 of their 39 overall locations have actually announced closure. A little bit about Lucky's. If we dig into the history here, you can see that it's based just north of where you live now, Trent, in Boulder, Colorado. They came into the week with those 39 locations that I previously mentioned, but were incredibly spread out geographically, so all throughout the United States spanning a variety of states. Most of the locations, however, are in Florida. Indeed, 20 of the locations set to close are located in Florida. You wonder the extent to which Publix's efforts actually worked in that space, in that particular region. They are just massive, winning all sorts of media awards for best operator in the grocery space. They were founded fairly recently, was Lucky's, in 2003 by Bo and Trish Sharon, Many of the developments Lucky's Market pioneered have since been adopted by other chains, including in-store beer and wine services. 
The beer and wine was basically a lost leader for them as local beer sold for as low as $2 a pint and wine for as low as $3 a glass. However, they caught national attention when Kroger invested in the company in 2016. At the time, it seemed like a reasonable buy-in as Kroger sought to expand their market share in natural and organics. Of course, that's been an overarching initiative for that company. As time has gone on, though, the dynamic in this space has definitely changed. Kroger has been able to substantially build out their natural and organic offerings by themselves and while attempting to improve their in-store shopping experience in several of their more important markets. And so that leads us to say that it could be an issue with expanding too quickly. When Kroger bought in, there were just 17 lucky stores. So we're really seeing exponential expansion since that point in time, likely expansion beyond capable distribution networks. Yeah, so 17 to 39 stores within the span of just a few years. And you can go back even as recently as 2018. There were articles on the Supermarket News website regarding Lucky's expansion and how quickly it was coming and how it showed all kinds of momentum behind the retailer. And now we see perhaps this was a little bit too quick. Now, as far as markets they expanded to, honestly, if you've ever been to a Lucky's, a lot of these markets make sense other than maybe their massive Florida expansion because they expanded in Florida. You wonder if that was an initiative to try and beat out Publix as Publix was opening up those green wise markets in Florida. Again, with that Publix connection, Leighton mentioned the amount of market share, not only the market share, but also share of mind of the consumer that Publix has there. You figured the green wise markets were probably going to win out in a competition. And it seems that has been the case. But generally speaking, these other markets, these spread out markets that they expanded to were growing areas. They have universities. They have millennial populations that are often cited as shopping at these type of stores. Their closures include stores that they've opened in Savannah, Georgia, again, kind of a a tourist town seen as a town that's on the rise. Bloomington, Indiana, home of Indiana University. Louisville, which is another town that's seen as kind of getting to be on the rise with a rising, certainly, food and drink scene there. Ann Arbor, Michigan, home of the University of Michigan in Springfield, Missouri. If you're unfamiliar with that area, Springfield is kind of the aesthetic center, if you will, of southern Missouri. Missouri State University is there, but also, again, growing millennial population that's there. So these are all stores that were opened up recently. And other closures like Billings and Missoula, Montana, also Jackson, Wyoming, which, by the way, has the last Kmart that's in the state of Wyoming. Those reflect towns similar to the ones that Natural Grocers has seen success in recently. We've talked over the last couple of years about Natural Grocers really embarking on initiatives to expand to these not necessarily small, but mid-sized mountain towns. Some could be classified as small. There's a Natural Grocers, for example, in a town called Salida, which is not too far from where I live, Salida, Colorado. And it's less than 10,000 people there, but they're finding success in those type of markets. Still, Billings, Missoula, Jackson, those are growing markets, mountain towns, and again, the exact type of towns that Natural Grocers has been seeing success in. So it really makes you scratch your head and wonder why the Lucky stores there weren't working out. They're also closing three stores in Colorado surrounding their headquarters, South Boulder, Wheat Ridge, and Longmont. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the Denver metro area, these are all within not necessarily a stone's throw of each other, but within certainly a quick drive of one another all surrounding their Boulder campus or their Boulder headquarters. Stores staying open, at least for now, include Fort Collins, where Colorado State University lies, and North Boulder, Colorado. Boulder, by the way, of course, home to the University of Colorado, but also West Melbourne, Florida. So they are keeping one Florida location. They're also keeping their two Ohio locations in Cleveland and Columbus, at least for now. Traverse City, Michigan, and Columbia, Missouri, which, again, another college town, home of the University of Missouri. So a lot of similarities between these towns that are having stores that are staying open, or cities, I should say, that are having stores that are staying open. But one similarity they don't have, geography. They are very far spread. Meanwhile, I wanted to look back at Kroger and Kroger's ownership share in Lucky's Markets because Leighton mentioned Kroger bought in, Lucky's expanded. Well, in December, it was mentioned on their earnings call that they were basically divesting their investment. Kroger CEO Rodney McMullen said on the call that they didn't feel as though the investment was creating an adequate return. In all likelihood, you know, Kroger had access to internal financials that indicated 
potentially a dead end for the concept as a whole, or maybe that a lot more money was needed to make it a viable concept. And if you dig a little bit deeper into that earnings call, you can really see those themes show up. Kroger's withdrawal of support, like we said, may or may not have led in part to these closures. I think it probably played a pretty big role because, again, you're cutting out that financial lifeline that you have. Certainly, though, served his writing on the wall back in December. Kroger recognized, by the way, an impairment charge of $238 million for Lucky's Market, but of real economic interest, they said on the call, it was a pre-tax charge of $131 million. Now, when you go back, look at some of the analyst Q&A surrounding Lucky's Markets after they first mentioned this on the call, they said that they actually provided additional funding to Lucky's after their original 2016 investment. So this was not a, hey, we're going to throw money at you, you're going to do with this money, whatever you want with, and we're going to be kind of a passive partner. They continued to put this money into Lucky's. And we just talked last week about companies putting good money after bad. And again, it doesn't seem as though this was necessarily the case for too long for Kroger here because they did back out of it. But certainly they did put quite a bit of money towards this Lucky's investment. And it was asked why Kroger was pulling out of the investment on the earnings call, given that they cited double-digit comps for Lucky's as recently as 2018. McMullen reiterated it was basically mostly about scale. He didn't come out and say that verbatim, but he said the amount of investment required to see a return on par with Kroger's other initiatives that they already have scale on, that wasn't appealing for the company as a whole. And Gary Millerchip, another of Kroger's leadership team, said on the call exactly what we noted earlier. Kroger has become established enough in natural and organics that Lucky's was essentially unnecessary for them. They already had that presence in the natural and organic section. They did say, Miller Chip in particular said, they feel like there's a role for the smaller format store in the grocery marketplace as a whole. Not every store has to be one of those massive Kroger marketplaces, but what that role is, they don't know yet. Kroger doesn't know yet. So they would rather maybe sit this one out, sit on the sidelines for a little while until there's some movement one way or the other. And he also noted, and this is a great point in terms of small format grocery, Kroger's got a partnership with Walgreens. It's a newer partnership. It's going to give Kroger ample insight into small format grocery. And honestly, from our perspective, let's note that Walgreens' partnership is probably going to be less costly for Kroger, considering Kroger doesn't just have to keep throwing money at it to keep Walgreens stable. Walgreens is already on stable financial footing. Are they doing as well as their competitor CVS? No, but Kroger's not going to need to expend as much in the way of funds and resources to feel out small formats in that partnership versus what they had to have done in the Lucky's deal. The stores remaining certainly call into question exactly how efficiently their distribution platform will be able to work. We hear it from retailers all the time. Expansion to new or far-flung areas puts pressure on their internal distribution systems or to contract with third parties. However, it's even more the case when you lose economies of scale in certain regions, or in this case, the whole country. We've seen retailers who are cutting back attempt to close stores that would put undue pressure on infrastructure, or in this case, the remaining seven stores are located in four very different and spread out regions across the country. Additionally, one must ask what will happen to the real estate left behind. And of course, as is always the case, we have to talk a little bit about real estate during this show as it pertains to retail and the retail environment. With Lucky's not seeking bankruptcy, it is likely a possibility that they will either have to reach settlements with the landlords that own those particular buildings or continue paying on the leases. Their stores were typically around 35,000 square feet, making them pretty much an objectively difficult fit for most other grocery chains out there. And most of these leases were signed just recently in 2018, meaning they could have a substantial term left, up to 18 years left on some of them, we speculate. This will likely weigh on the balance sheet of the retailer further unless they happen to seek bankruptcy at some point in the near future. But Trent, We're talking about very large settlements here. We're talking about extremely large burdens for the retailer having to keep up the buildings, not just paying the leases. Typically, leases with grocery stores would have them responsible for windows, doors, and other fixtures while the building is occupied. And we say occupied, meaning under lease. So even though they're vacant, they still have to pay attention to those details. Very interesting to see the future of their balance sheet and those stores that are left behind. 
So that's our top news story we covered here on the podcast. It's time now for this week's interview. After this, we'll be joined by Marianne Slamish. She's the head of marketing at Pointer, and we're going to discuss some of those space-based technologies. By space, I don't mean outer space. I mean space within a retail store and what Pointer is working on as far as deep location for retailers and retail services to consumers. For several years now, we've discussed brands' attempts at location-based services for customers in store. The now-defunct Toys R Us was notable for having or attempting to have these services during the holiday season, but several other retailers in the U.S., Walmart chief among them, have tried to make things more convenient for shoppers by steering them to a correct product location. Even still, we see these services as currently constructed sometimes fall short of their idealized versions. The aforementioned Walmart still looks to members of their reset teams to direct customers to newly moved products, as an example. These issues might be a thing of the past, though, as UK-based company in Pointer has proof of concept with their location services with major airports and airlines and has recently been working with CBRE and others to build out their platform in a retail setting. To discuss the next frontier of these services in retail, we're pleased to be joined by Marianne Slamish, the head of marketing at Pointer. Marianne, thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Now, first, we should mention you've been at the NRF Big Show for the last couple of days. How did things go at the show for Pointer and what really did you take away from the Big Show this year? Yeah, that's right. We were over the last three days. We had some really interesting meeting with partners and retailers at the show. We were invited by Microsoft to pitch at their event as well. And we had some really overwhelmingly positive feedback. I really think retailers have been waiting for digital mapping at scale for a long time. And they were glad to see it's, it's happening. So yeah, very good for us so far. It's worth noting it was my first NRF. So it was very exciting for me to be here. Nice. It was your first NRF, so was it a little bit of a, you know, you go into that place and oftentimes it can be overwhelming your first time. So did you find that out your first day or two? <laughs> yeah, a little bit actually, but it's fine because we had meetings set up before the show, so we were not walking endlessly in the L's, so that it was quite good for us. Well, that's a positive. Now, you mentioned that retailers have been waiting for these services for some time, and you can go back to articles, you know, even 10 years ago saying like, hey, these services are right around the corner, but for one reason or another, other company services just have kind of fallen flat. But I wanted to talk about Pointer's system because diving into it a little bit, it's interesting. The system isn't Wi-Fi based or anything like that. I was wondering if you could give us some background as far as how Pointer's system works and how it differentiates itself from other location-based services we've seen in the past. Yes, of course. So, yeah, so you mentioned that people have tried to do location for a long time now and it was never accurate enough. And that's where Pointer comes in. So we're a team of 40 based in Europe mostly, and we are 90% computer scientists and machine learning engineers. And we've built something we call Deep Location, which is a system, an engine that combines machine learning and sensor fusion to increase the accuracy of Bluetooth beacons. We work with Bluetooth beacons because we think it's the best performing at this stage. But we're hardware agnostic, and in the future, we'll be looking at new technologies like ultra wideband. But right now, what we find is combining Bluetooth with deep location allows us to have really good accuracy for indoor positioning, which enables location based services, location based analytics, and location based marketing, whether it's in retail stores, in airports, shopping centers, hotels. We also work with, as you mentioned, with corporate campuses and smart workplace. So yeah, we combine hardware and software and we've built our own algorithms. We call it deep location powered by seven patents. That's how we do it. And we've seen retailers use a lot of these platforms for internal analytics, but oftentimes that doesn't go to the consumer as a consumer facing product, if you will. So I'm kind of wondering exactly in what ways does Pointer's system work towards the consumer to benefit the consumer? Because you have a, a number of different things that you can offer consumers using this technology. Yeah, that's true. So there are two ways to do location. You can do with engagement with an app or you can do app free. So it's true that a lot of retailers have done app free to offer location based analytics that enable them to have hit maps, understand consumer journeys in their stores, crowd flows footfall and this kind of stuff. 
But what we see more and more is retailers want to have an app. Since 2014, we work with Harrods. We've built their mobile store guides. So they've got this app and they enable wayfinding on the app. So they've got an, a map, blue dot on the map. And then they enable people to search, find and navigate to anything they want in the store. So this is really the start of location-based services, wayfinding and being able to have a digital product catalog and to enable people to search the teddy bear that they've been looking for. But then think about it. If you combine it with your CRM, with loyalty, it gets even better because you're able to, to tell, oh yeah, this is the VIP experience for this particularly loyal client who just walked in the store. Maybe they've bought something online and they want to click and collect. So the moment they walked in the store, you're able to tell them, hey, go to check in 24 because that's where your product is. And because retailers know that the person has just walked in the store, they're able to prepare the product so that it's ready even when the person comes in. Or maybe it's personalized notifications as user walk in the L and they walk by the perfume section. And we're able to say, okay, two days ago, this person has liked this particular perfume. I'm going to push a product recommendation, product review, or maybe an offer, a specific 20% off or, or this type of offer. So it's location-based marketing, it's location-based services, but also, so these are all client-facing apps. And you could also tell, something I didn't talk about, but when you're in a large shopping mall, it could be location sharing with your family and friends. If you're sitting at a restaurant and you want to share your location, just like you do outdoors with, with GPS, with Google Maps, WhatsApp, location sharing, we enable this indoors because obviously it does not work indoors because GPS signals bounce off the walls. So that's what we enable indoors. So I'm talking about location sharing, but it could be also location sharing with sales assistants. So let's say you're in a very large grocery store and you want to request assistance at your live location, just at the tap of a button, someone comes and helps you. And what we can also do is we, we partner with Honeywell. Honeywell, they have hardware that they provide to sales assistants in stores to make better inventory management and to make sure they've got all the information they need on the product. And what we do is we're able to add on top of that a layer with real-time location, which means that let's say you're a sales assistant at a large grocery store, you're able to say, okay, there are 40 t-shirts in my store and this is inventory that's provided by RFID, but you're able to combine that with actual product location. So it's not just we've got 40 t-shirts in the store, it's we've got 40 t-shirts and here's where they are exactly. There are this LB2 and let me take you there. So sales assistants are able to help shoppers. Oh yeah, I know where the t-shirts are, let me take you there. So these are all use cases I'm throwing at you and I know it's a bit overwhelming. We also do asset tracking, especially interesting at airports. We haven't done that much asset tracking for retailers so far, but I'm sure there are some really interesting use cases as well. But for airports, it's wheelchairs and trolleys. It's very valuable assets. So how do you make sure you don't lose them? How do you make sure they're at the right place at the right time for when people come from their flight, they can actually use the trolleys. So we're able to track it with Bluetooth tags and the personnel at the airport is able to see it on an iPad, see where each trolley is. And because of that, they're able to put them at the right place at the right time. I wanted to kind of backtrack to the part of the platform where customers can request support. And you kind of talked about it a little bit in your last answer. So we know those capabilities are there, but you know, from a cynical point of view, you could see maybe the retailer not executing on the technology that Pointer is providing correctly. So in terms of implementation and really making sure that customers do get the chance to access help through the app, what do retailers have to do? What must they do to ensure that those type of systems are executed correctly? I think that's a great question and that's exactly the challenge. So at Pointer, we provide a mobile SDK that retailers can integrate into their app. We are not an app provider. So what we do is we partner with, whether it's app providers, retailers, we partner with lighting companies who put beacons inside their lighting infrastructure as well so that retailers can leverage existing hardware. But you do need an ecosystem of partners to make it happen. So we at Pointer, we facilitate that we are able to provide hardware and we're able to integrate our SDK with more or less any other application. But yeah, it's true that retailers need basically to make it happen with their app. I forgot to mention something that's quite important. We actually help retailers doing the first step toward their 
digitalization by combining physical and digital. And we do that by enabling them to map their stores at scale. So what it does is once the moment they have CAD files, CAD maps, we're able to digitize those maps to make them interactive, make them scrollable and integrate them to their mobile app or to their web app or to their kiosk or to their website. So the idea is the moment you've got a digital map for all your stores, and I'm talking a thousand stores or 10,000 stores, the moment you've got a digital map that's auto-updating and that you can leverage for location-based services, that's when you can integrate it to your app and make the most out of it. So what we do at Pointer is the blue dot and we put it on a map, if that makes sense. And we integrate with retailers app to help them leverage that for location-based services, analytics and marketing. We talked about in the beginning, it isn't just about helping customers find their way, although most of Pointer's location-based services are customer facing. As we talked about, there's always an analytics benefit to these type of systems. What's some of the data that can be realized by retailers that implement these type of systems? So, I mean, it depends on what kind of retailer you are. If you're a shopping mall, a grocery store, or a department store, if you're a shopping mall, you don't have point of sale data. So we enable you to have a lot of information that you wouldn't normally have, which is, for example, who is coming into my shopping mall and for which store. So which store is actually driving value for my mall? I think that's quite interesting. So we're able to tell retailers, okay, how long is a person staying in store? What is a typical customer journey? So we're able to have spaghetti diagrams that are not on paper, but actually on the, on the dashboard. So we're able to see individual customer journey through the store, which informs merchandising decisions. Maybe there is a bottleneck somewhere and you're able to work on that. We're also able to show heat maps. So let's say you're a shopping mall. So you're all about creating experiential stuff in your shopping mall, right? Maybe you're organizing a concert. And you want to see how many people actually stayed more than 20 minutes to watch my Miley Cyrus concerts at this given time. And you're able to find ROI for your marketing efforts and your events. And I think that's really helpful for retailers. And something that I also think is helpful for retailers is they're able to see who their most valuable clients are. You're able to see who is a returning customer, how many times have they come to your shopping mall or to your grocery store, which parts have they visited the most. And because of that, that's when you're able to push a notification. So I see location-based analytics, marketing and services to all combined, because the moment you've got all these great insights about customer behavior, that's when you're able to engage with your customer and provide them with really interesting services. Obviously, you can track assets as well. So you can see if assets need to be replaced. You can see the inventory, the product location. Um, yeah, this type of stuff. One final thing, you know, because Pointer has, again, proof of concept, this technology has been used for some time now at airports, at retailers, and so forth. But I'm kind of curious as far as integrating with new retailers, integrating because you do business all throughout the globe, what are some of those areas of opportunity that you see going forward and, and what are some potential obstacles that you experience with those areas of opportunity? I guess that's one of the reasons. So our CEO is actually moving to Boston next week. We've been focused on Europe and Middle East and Asia so far. And we found that, so we started working with a major US department store very recently. So mapping a lot of stores, 700 stores for them. And we found that the US is a great opportunity for us because everything is very highly scalable. And this is what we're trying to get at. So for us, it's a great opportunity. And in terms of challenges so far, I guess it's evangelization trying to make people aware that this technology exists and that they can leverage it and finding the right partners to make it happen. Our head of partnerships, Trev, was, was at NRF today as well, make some really good connections and we've got some really great partners. We're very lucky to be supported by Microsoft, Honeywell and some of the partners out there who help us find the right retailers, talk to the right people. So yeah, it's a great opportunity for us. And yeah, I see the US markets going to be strong for Pointer going forward. And those are great partners to have, Microsoft, Honeywell, and the like, obviously, are, are well-connected to the U.S. retail system. Well, I want to thank you once again for joining us, Marianne Slamish, the head of marketing at Pointer. Thanks so much for taking time, especially out of what has been a very busy week for you to discuss Pointer. It's amazing. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time. 
Well, we thank Marianne Slamish once again for joining us on the podcast. If you want to check out what Pointer is doing, you can visit them at pointer.tech. That's P-O-I-N-T-R dot tech. So pointer.tech, some really cool stuff that they are working on for retailers. Again, they have retail partners already in Europe and about ready to expand those in the United States. Well, we move on here on the podcast and in Layton, we start off with kind of a, a shorter story, but one we certainly wanted to mention is yet another city will require retailers to take cash after New York City Council voted as such this week. Yeah, it's not often we talk about regulation on this show, but this directly ties into retail and those who do business within retail, within particular municipalities. This is similar to laws already in place in San Francisco and Philadelphia. While not yet set in stone, Mayor Bill de Blasio is expected to sign this bill into law. The punishment for not taking cash transactions for food and retail establishments who will still refuse those types of transactions are pretty steep. The fines are around $1,000 for the first offense and $1,500 for ensuing violations, so steep enough to force compliance. There will be a waiting period, of course, of around nine months before they would have to comply with these new regulations once the bill is signed officially by de Blasio. Additionally, the law would not apply to online transactions, and we kind of shake our head and nod, of course, on that because it's pretty hard to pay with cash during an online transaction. But in theory, this may provide a way for businesses to get around the system by forcing prepayments through apps or some such thing. So you could think about a little bit of creativity here, but that's a fairly significant hurdle to still jump through. Retailers who only want to accept cashless transactions must provide a machine that exchanges a gift card for cash, but must be ready to accept cash if that machine runs out of cash. Additionally, the bill prohibits cash customers from being charged a higher price than other customers using maybe credit or debit. As far as we could find, we are unsure how the law treats automated vending machines that are cashless, which, by the way, are extremely prevalent now throughout the West Coast where I live. You are seeing a lot of different vending machines that are only accepting card payments. And you see, Trent, here, the argument for this in New York is fairly straightforward. It it was said that as recently as 2015, 40% of the city's households were unbanked or underbanked. This is absolutely mind-blowing considering the increased number of services that can only be conducted via card or ACH transfer. According to a CNN article, it is said that in New York, this is more common among immigrants, people of color, and the elderly. The New York Post noted chains Dos Toros and by Chloe as businesses that could be impacted as they are currently cashless. And Trent, I know from your perspective, the argument for taking cash is a business-centric one as well. Yeah, I think, you know, you look at things and cash is a marginal hassle for these retailers. And certainly there are a couple of chains. You mentioned Dos Toros by Chloe that, you know, are going to be card only or were going to be card only. That was kind of their overall goal. But cash is a marginal hassle. Sure, I get that as someone that's run retail stores, as someone that's worked for other retail chains certainly is not the easiest thing to process. But data continues to show us that cash is still used for a ton of transactions, including around half of low dollar transactions. In fact, there was a study that we cited on the podcast last year from creditcards.com. It was a study that surveyed 2,500 U.S. adults all throughout the country. 49% of U.S. adults, according to this study, pay cash for purchases under $10. So we're looking at about half of U.S. adults paying cash for purchases under $10. And what's even more amazing is if you have a rewards credit card, maybe you're not underbanked, maybe you're not unbanked, maybe you've got that option. Still, 43% of users still preferred to pay for those transactions using cash. Denying use of cash probably pushes some of these transactions to card. So if you're not unbanked or underbanked, you can always use your card in that circumstance. But it also turns away a not insignificant number of customers that are unbanked or underbanked or maybe don't have cards with them. And you can make every argument for the inconvenience of cash from a retailer's perspective. But Looking at it from you know retail owner's perspective or retail manager's perspective, the charges to make cash deposits through banks, the need to count tills to insure against shrink, 
is likely a break even. Even the risk you run of, if you wanted to think about it this way, the risk you run of someone coming in, robbing you, taking the cash out of the till or what have you. Again, still a break even. At worst, when you consider the customers turned away and cards are not free to accept. There are still card swipe fees. Card swipe fees are not going anywhere. They're still fairly substantial. Even if you use a system like Square, like Clover, you're still paying 2.75% per transaction, even if there's no per swipe fee. So again, there's a trade-off there. There is no such thing as a free lunch. There's no free money. Even if you take cash, it's not necessarily considered free money because every time you make a cash deposit, if you've got a business checking account set up with a bank, in all likelihood, you are paying every time you're using those bank services. So again, there are some costs there, but it's valuable to not turn these customers away. And remember, a lot of your customers find it more convenient to use cash. So just because I don't necessarily find it more convenient to use cash doesn't mean that your customers won't. And retail is not necessarily about what the retailer finds more convenient. It's about what the customer finds more convenient. You know, the other thing I go back to is we back in 2018, we interviewed someone from APG Cash Drawer on the Retail Focus podcast. And they talked about there are a lot of new technologies where if you're worried about tills coming up short, if you're worried about cashiers having to count back the cash, there are solutions for that. There are cash drawers that are weighted so they will tell you how much money should be in the cash drawer. They measure it after every transaction. There are options out there. So if you're worried about shrink, if you're worried about a till coming up short for a retailer, there are solutions that aren't all that costly that are out there that allow you to accept cash and accept cash more easily. But also in talking to that representative from APG Cash Drawer, he said, you know, people told us 15, 20 years ago that cash was no longer going to be a thing. And they're saying that now, and it still hasn't happened. Remember, an overarching theme that we talk about on the podcast is retail moves at a glacial pace. And it's not because retailers necessarily always move at a glacial pace, but it's also because you have to remember retail is there to serve the customer. And if the customer doesn't want to use a credit card for a transaction, it's incumbent upon you as the retailer to meet them where they're at in terms of cash. One final thing I'll note on this subject, and you know, it kind of comes back to the overarching theme of the social responsibility of the retailer in this case. And that's kind of what's been mentioned as this law has been passed at least through to the mayor of New York is that there is this overarching social responsibility for retailers. I also wonder if we're not going to see some regulations coming up regarding the potential digital divide and how that impacts retailers. When I was in higher education, we talked about the digital divide all the time. Basically, there are large swaths of the country, large populations of people that don't have access to things like smartphones or don't know how to use smartphones, the internet, that type of thing. Well, if you've been to a Kroger, you've been to basically any grocery store in the last five to 10 years, you've probably seen digital coupons, digital deals, things where you get discounts if you use the app. And you kind of wonder if there's not something around the corner where people are going to have to scale that back a little bit because you could say, well, you know, yeah, they get a benefit again if they're using these digital resources. But as we see with this New York law, it explicitly prohibits you from charging cash customers more than card customers. And I wonder, just kind of in the back of my mind, I'm not advocating for it any means. Uh, am I advocating for more regulation in this regard? But you kind of wonder if that's not the next thing that legislators decide to tackle in some of these markets where, again, there's this big technical and digital divide and a lot of people don't have access or don't have the know-how to use smartphones. I don't think, you know, a lot of times we're in retail, we talk about technology, we talk about all of this cool new stuff. And in fact, on this very show, we just talked to Marianne Slamish from Pointer about this cool technology that people can leverage their smartphones to use. People don't understand how many just general U.S. shoppers don't know or don't understand how to use smartphones to a certain level. I still talk to people on a weekly basis that don't even have email addresses. So again, just something to consider. And it's important to be mindful of all of your consumers when you run a retail store. And I think that's kind of the overall arching point to this story is it's important to be mindful of everyone because you want to make sure that that customer has an experience where they're willing to come back. And if they're turned away because they don't have a credit card, 
it's probably obviously not going to be the case. And when that customer is banked, you're probably not going to be top of mind for them as well. We switch gears a little bit for this podcast, and this podcast is a little bit of everything as we look to news to counter all of the closure announcements that are seen in major media. Mars Retail Group announced plans for U.S. brick-and-mortar expansion, while some news outlets, <clears throat> USA Today, expose their lack of in-depth retail knowledge by talking about the fires that are consuming retail this week. Mars Retail Group slipped under the radar by talking about said brick and mortar expansion as has been said many times on this podcast retail is doing just fine as the holiday numbers would show and all of the recent nrf forecasts that we've been talking about undifferentiated retail is struggling is struggling mightily if we're talking about kmart and sears and other bankrupt retailers but to that point it's tough to find a more differentiated retailer than those under the Mars Retail Group banner. Specifically, Mars Retail Group is looking to expand their suite of M&M stores by opening in major attractions across the United States. And abroad as well, by the way, a little bit of an international presence sprinkled in. First, a little bit about Mars Retail Group, a subsidiary of Mars. They oversee the retail presences of the company. Of the M&M stores in particular, they are the most prominent. Technically, the current M&M stores are branded as M&M's World, and they have a few present locations in New York, Las Vegas, Orlando in the U.S., and of course, London and Shanghai internationally. I mentioned that international presence. However, they are involved in sister brand Ethel M Chocolates, and more specifically, Ethel M's e-commerce presence. M&M's have quite the e-commerce presence themselves, centered around personalized gifts, bulk candy, or products for special events such as weddings. You see a lot of merchandising done on behalf of M&M's. Now, about those planned openings throughout the U.S., although the national headlines surrounding this story weren't plentiful, the plans surrounding the Mall of America for Mars Retail Group did catch a little bit of press out there, and so this is more or less the reason why we're talking about this. There are or have been rumblings surrounding the Mall of America as people start to wonder if it's still the attraction it once was and if it can continue to draw traffic to the same extent it once did 20 years ago. And Mall of America, by the way, such a massive story. We talk about mall evolution. They have certainly tried to keep traffic levels up during the last decade or two. And this is going to be one of those things where you see conventional malls trying pretty much anything they can to keep the traffic robust inside their malls. But Mall of America, of course, a massive staple there in its home state of Minnesota. But Mars Retail Group's plan suggests that the mall is still very much a draw, which is good news for them, at least to specialty retailers as they look towards opening a two-story location there. This store will be considered M&M's new flagship store in the United States and will be around 20 4,000 square feet in total. This is truly massive for a candy shop. Trent, let's put that in perspective real quick. We were talking about those potential vacancies from Lucky's a couple stories ago. 30,000 feet or 35,000 feet for them. This M&M store will almost come close to that. It's very interesting how just the sheer size of this store is going to hold up. Mars Retail Group says it will pay homage to Midwest culture. We're both from the Midwest, Trent, and we don't entirely know what that means. Maybe we're talking about all of the the candy that's eaten throughout the Midwest. I, I, I'm not for sure, but the Mall of America opening is slated for opening in late 2020 with the hope that it will be ready for the holiday shopping season, which of course is a good goal to try to set. Other openings include Berlin, Germany, and a relocation in Orlando inside Walt Disney World. Friend of the podcast, CBRE, helped Mars Retail Group scout and identify the new locations. These stores will have some similar features, including what the company calls Wall of Chocolate and the ability to create custom M&Ms. Customization is something that Mars Retail Group is continuously pushing and a big reason why they require so much space in each location. Again, 24,000 square feet, just a massive store that's being proposed here. Yeah, and I'm not sure about the Midwest culture thing in Mall of America. Maybe they'll celebrate terrible weather, I guess. Uh, terrible hot weather in the summer and then terribly cold, blustery weather 
in the winter. Speaking of customization and personalization, though, Patrick McIntyre, who's their director of global retail for Mars Retail Group, said that these new store developments are designed to create that stronger connection with those that come in. We're actually going to talk to an interview guest on the show next week about kind of the experience economy, if you will. It's a great conversation with Andrew Bird of In Moment next week, and he'll talk a little bit more about this connection, but it is so crucial for retailers, and it's not just about what people experience in the store. It's about what people experience before and afterwards, and that's what M&M's is gunning for here, or really the Mars Retail Group. They want it to be a memorable experience for the customer, top to bottom, almost like a theme park there. As with any press release about an immersive experience that we see from a retailer, they do figure to use various forms of AR and AI to assist in their marketing endeavors. And we discussed the idea that these type of stores are really more marketing tools than anything else. We would be honestly surprised if any of these M&M stores that are opening up managed to turn an actual profit. However, when done correctly, the marketing potential, the potential to reach customers with your brand is essentially unlimited because these stores provide an experiential aspect that other confectioners, other candy bars would be hard-pressed to replicate outside of Hershey Park in Pennsylvania, of course. But real estate as advertisement has worked well in the past for some brands, although we've seen a bit of pullback of late. Several brands have opted to close their Times Square locations, and that's kind of the primary example of Retail locations as marketing that we see in the United States is opening up in Times Square. I think Mall of America would be close second to that. Now, as far as macro level candy consumption in the U.S., I did kind of a deep dive on this because we can talk about these M&M stores and these locations. But obviously, M&M's feels as though really the Mars Retail Group does that these are going to have legs and it's valuable for these stores to be set up because candy isn't going anywhere in the U.S., So macro level candy consumption in the U.S., when you look there, there's an expected rise in sales over the next five years, in particular for non-chocolate candies. Now, non-chocolate candies, that doesn't really help Mars much. But as far as chocolate specific products is concerned, those are expected to see an increase in sales from a dollar perspective as well. Mordor Intelligence projects chocolate sales in the U.S. to have a compound annual growth rate of 4% through 2024. So basically growing 4% through 2024. And while that may appear to be good news for the likes of M&Ms, we should keep in mind that actually much of the demand recently is fueled by the premium and healthy chocolate segment, which of course demands higher prices per pound in the retail marketplace. Revenue for the premium chocolate market, just as an example, was around $3.87 billion in 2018. Now that is a drop in the bucket compared to cheaper chocolate products like Snickers, M&Ms, Hershey bars, that type of thing, but it is substantial nonetheless. And likewise, the compound annual growth rate for dark chocolate is expected to actually be greater than that for milk chocolate, expected to come in at 5.2% per year through 2024. It's going to far outpace milk chocolate products over that time. And we typically talk about that 4% compound annual growth rate overall that's forecast for chocolate in the U.S. We think of that as outpacing food inflation, but that might be a bit deceptive. Unfortunately for the chocolate industry, costs of goods sold have gone up by a significant margin over the last three years. When you look at the price of chocolate overall, it is very volatile on the marketplace. And chocolate, I really mean cocoa there in terms of importing cocoa into the United States. So you look, in 2017, prices for chocolate actually cratered. You didn't see much of a price correction in the marketplace. Prices remained kind of high, so retail margins were pretty good on that, and manufacturer margins were pretty good in 2017. However, after that crater, prices shot up 39% in just four months for cocoa in 2018. And this takes about 9 to 10 months before the price increases really hit the retail marketplace. Currently, the price for cocoa is around $2,700 per metric ton. It was around $1,900 per metric ton in 2017. So you're seeing an increase very close to 50% over that span, which is a massive jump for the cost of cocoa. And in fact, news just broke earlier this month that Ghana and Ivory Coast have formed a cocoa cartel. They are actually the world's top cocoa producers currently. They produce 60% of the world's cocoa. 
but the countries do plan to raise prices, which are expected to hit the chocolate market in October of 2020. Again, a nine to 10 month waiting period before you really see that affect the market. Now, Hershey has already said they plan to raise prices by 9% in the coming year on their products to keep up with demand. Hershey, of course, not Mars, but just an example as far as those value price chocolates are concerned. And when you factor in projected price increases, we see that it's a very distinct possibility that a 4% compound annual growth rate for chocolate may actually mean declining sales by unit. And still, even with rising cocoa prices, it's estimated that most chocolate candy has around a 42 to 43% retail markup, which I find interesting. That's a larger retail markup than you see in most items in the grocery stores. Now, this includes any distribution markup as well, but... When you look at this markup as a whole and you wonder why M&M or Mars Retail Group might open a store like this, well, when the seller is the distributor, like Mars in this case, that retail markup is very substantial for those chocolates. So you're seeing input costs be fairly low compared to other retailers in terms of products that they're carrying. You're seeing the need to not go through third-party distribution channels because you are the manufacturer of the product. And because of that, we don't anticipate in a, de a decline in the retail viability of having an M&M store anytime soon. Now, again, don't anticipate that to make money necessarily, but some of that financial hit is softened a little bit when you compare it to, say, like the FAO Schwartz store on Times Square closing because you're looking at margins being that much higher in the industry. And that, we found that kind of interesting. That's one, one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about it is because you don't think about candy being a high margin item, generally speaking, for retail stores. But the reality of it is, it seems to carry a little bit more margin than most products do, especially most impulse buys. And M&M's looking to take advantage of that. Hopefully it turns out well for Mars Retail Group. As always, we may have a position in or against companies we discuss on the podcast. Do not invest in stocks solely on the input of the podcast hosts. Well, we've reached the final segment here on the Retail Focus Podcast, a segment we call Looking Ahead, where H. Layton and I look ahead to a story we're keeping an eye on over the next week, month, or year. And some people will call us retail permables, if you will. I think there's a reason to be bullish about retail. We've talked about the retail numbers, yet we've talked on the episode about undifferentiated retail like Express struggling, closing stores, they're dominating the headlines. And we've always talked about, hey, don't pay too much attention to retail store closure numbers because, again, you've got retailers like Dollar General just opening up a massive amount of stores in this coming year. You're looking at seven to 800 stores being opened by Dollar General alone. But there is one retailer that's both differentiated and that we were pretty bearish on coming into it, declaring that they closed all their stores this week. And that's what Layton's looking ahead to. My looking ahead story has to do with specialty retailer Papyrus, who has had a presence in the retail industry or the niche retail industry for around 70 years. They were established in 1950. And you see a message from Papyrus themselves says, due to circumstances, they are closing all of their retail stores. And those circumstances, Trent, are pretty much straightforward. One of the reasons why they are closing their stores throughout the United States, all nearly 260 stores throughout the U.S., is that they had an undifferentiated model. Even though they had a specialty retail presence, what they sold was simply not enough for those online competitors such as Amazon and Staples. If you go to Papyrus's website, papyrusonline.com, you can see that the retailer, for all it's worth, didn't have much in the way of merchandise selection. They sold greeting cards, they sold stationery, they sold gifts, and wrapping paper, tissue paper, boxes for, again, gifts for all seasons, and gift card holders. Niche products. Again, we're going to keep using those same words because these are specialty products that do not, for one, have a ton of demand, and for two... You can buy online for pennies on the dollar in bulk. And so I feel as though that combined with their lack of omni-channel really made it such that it was more of a matter of time before this particular retailer in Papyrus shut their doors. But what's interesting, Trent, if you look through the history of this retailer, they've been struggling, yes, 
over the last couple of decades. But at their peak, they had over 450 stores throughout the U.S. And so you're looking again at uh, an area of opportunity for landlords to try to backfill this particular space. They had varying footprints in a multitude of states. And you really have to scratch your head because they saw this coming. Papyrus did, again, have a website. I'm looking at it right now as we're recording this podcast. Yet they failed to really integrate any of those mechanisms that all those other larger retail competitors have. And so we talk about stationary products sometimes on this podcast. So within stationary, you have a lot of office supplies and things of that nature where you can build out a subscription model or you can identify things that your customers or or common customers buy on a regular basis and then try to promote those things through emails and other marketing tools. They didn't do any of that. And I feel as though, again, it was more of management's decision to not act and then just to let the market play out. And then here you are, sadly, having to close 260 stores. I will drive home this last point in that this doesn't necessarily play into the larger narrative of the retail apocalypse and that all stores are closing that are in brick and mortar form. This is more of a matter of a retailer seeing the future, but then not identifying key functions to really enable an omni-channel function throughout its website and its stores and really create a model that will continue to bring in customers. So this is just one example of a retailer really not acquiescing to the market evolution. And I think also, frankly, the lack of merchandise and merchandise mix over the years really did them in. And we should mention, you know, the company owned by Sherman Retail Group, but it's licensed through its owner, American Greetings. So Papyrus branded products will still appear in stores, just like American Greetings products appear in stores. But the stores themselves, the specialty stores, will be closing. Well, mine's an, another kind of bummer story, if you will, for retail, but it might have a potential positive ending for the retail landscape as a whole. The reason I call it a bummer story is it was announced this week that more than 200 hay needle employees were told on Thursday that they'd be laid off and the home base in Omaha will be closed. It's been a tough couple of years for Omaha-based retail. You think about some of the brands that have moved away from Omaha, some of the headquarters that have moved away from Omaha over the last few years. You think about Cabela's, you think about Gordman's declaring bankruptcy and then being bought out by stage. So not so great. Hay Needle, by the way, began as hammocks.com back in 2002, but they were recently brought under the wing of Walmart. And the reason these layoffs are occurring is not necessarily because Hay Needle has been unsuccessful. It is because Walmart is absorbing completely the Hay Needle business and some of those common roles they feel like can be fulfilled by those internal Walmart e-commerce employees, whether that's Jet.com employees or other employees that exist under Walmart's banners. Now, Hayneedle was originally acquired by Jet.com, and Jet.com then was acquired by Walmart. So Walmart didn't out and out buy Hayneedle, but they were a Jet.com property. Walmart obviously sees some value in bringing Hayneedle under their wing. Now, one should note that Hayneedle now with these layoffs will have lost about 400 plus workers from the Omaha area, but Walmart obviously sees some value in bringing it under their wing. Just to give you an idea, if you're not familiar with the website, it is similar to a Wayfair.com. There's a lot of outdoor living stuff on their website, home furnishings, decor, all of that. Last sales that we know of was back in 2016. They posted sales of around $500 million. They've got a couple of different fulfillment centers, one in California and one in Ohio, but they were based in Nebraska. So they're moving basically their headquarters. They're going to be under the Walmart wing. My looking ahead is how is Walmart going to utilize Hayneedle and the Hayneedle site? Are we going to start seeing those same marketing pushes that we saw from the other Walmart acquired brands in the e-commerce space? Or is Walmart eventually just going to subsume Hay Needle into their own website. I think this is very important as far as the direction Walmart is looking to take for e-commerce. This might be a small part of Walmart's overall e-commerce pie, but it's an important part of their business nonetheless. 
Again, it's been a standalone business to this point, but now officially under Walmart's wing. Well, that'll do it for us here on the Retail Focus Podcast. A big thanks to those of you that listen on a week-to-week basis. We also want to thank Marianne Slamish of Pointer for joining us here on the podcast. Again, we'll be back a week from now. We've got an interview set up with Andrew Bird of In Moment. It's a great interview. Highly suggest you tune in for that. We'll be back about seven days right in your podcast app. This has been the Retail Focus Podcast. For more, visit our website at retailfocuspodcast.com and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. Follow us on Twitter at Retail Podcast.